31 and we'll call a meeting to order. Um, the focus of the meeting today, we'll talk about school learning modalities and board authority to do such. Um, we're going to review the strategic planning discussion that we had started at our uh, retreat a few weeks ago. Um, on our agenda, you could see that there's a discussion of equity, but I chatted with Emily Therian and Dana Decker, and we decided they decided they'd rather have that on the agenda next month. So that will be uh, postponed till September. All right, so do I have someone who's willing to be the meeting evaluator? Hello? Meeting evaluator? Rachel, you're meeting. Oh, no! Okay. Uh, first off is uh, public comment. Um, and I just wanted to assure people that we will have another time for public comment after Lane's discussion of uh, next year. So, But right now, um, if you have something you would like to add to the conversation, please do. I'm going to mute myself and we'll wait for people who Did you get want to uh, comment publicly. Did you find the email? Did you well, is there public on there that I need to document? I'm going to forward it. So, I can't how am I going to do that? I'm not on the I can't find the link. So, you, do you want a piece of paper? Do so I do that one? And then if they're doing public comment, you probably want to do turn your volume up and then turn it down if somebody here in our group is good dexterity. Just if you get the guests for me. Thank you. So far I have not heard from anyone. Is there anyone uh, on this call who would like to make a comment um, publicly right now? Okay, hearing none, we will move uh, next to our first order of business, which is board management and governance. This is Lane's uh, discussion of school learning modalities. All right, right Lane. All right. All right. So, so what happened in about a week and a half ago um, is we got updated guidance um, from the Agency of Education as well as a new directive from the governor. Um, they changed three basic things. Uh, the first is it took the authority for determining the learning modality that districts was in out of the hands of the Secretary um, of Education and put it into the hands of the school board. And so one of the things that you need to have a discussion about and decide tonight is whether the board wants to retain the authority um, to determine what learning modality uh, the district should be in at any given time or whether the board wants to vote to rest that authority with the superintendent and with the cabinet. Um, the other two changes uh, that happened at that time was, uh, the first was that the superintendent now has the authority to close the schools due to COVID um, after a consultation with uh, the Vermont Department of Health. Um, and prior to that, that was reserved for the Secretary of Education. And then the last thing, and probably one of the bigger things, um, was the fact that the governor ordered that there will be no in-person um, students in the schools until September 8th. Um, so those were the biggies. But the, the big thing for the board to discuss and determine is um, learning modality authority, whether the board wants to retain that or whether it wants to hand over the authority of the superintendent of the cabinet. All right, amongst board members, is there a discussion about that issue right now? Well, I personally would like to see the kids in school five days a week. I guess what I'm asking is whether um, we have discussed, I think the first order of business really is whether we want to retain the authority or we you want to delegate the, that authority to Lane and the administration to decide how these schools are going to operate. So really that's the first order of discussion. Um, can you just remind us who is on the cabinet just for the good of everybody that's here? So when we talk about the superintendent and the cabinet, who would that include? Lane, do you want to take that? Hang on one second. 
Shahi was on the cabinet? Yeah, can you speak okay, into the so mic? Elijah Hawks, principal at the high school. Um, Kaylee let, Sutton, co-principal. I'll let him answer that. Go ahead. Yeah. So sorry about that. What was the question? Who's on the cabinet? Lane? Who's on the cabinet? It's uh, the principals and the director. So Elijah Hawks, uh, Katie Sutton at the high school, um, David Roller, right, uh, Brookfield. We've got Erica McLaughlin, principal at RES, and then Pat Miller over at Braintree, um, as well as Steve Kinney, the special education director, uh, and myself. Felicia is as well, sorry about that. And Lisa Floyd is um, in kind of her new role uh, as examining the seventh and eighth grade, the, the middle school model as we call it, would also be involved. Other questions from the board around, um, you know, how this sort of designation of authority would operate? So I have, I have a question just in terms of we have our policy, we would be going against our policies if we decide that we are going to then op, take on the responsibility as a board to determine how kids are going to be educated, how the schools are going to operate. When you look at our, our delegation of authority, we pretty much said to Lane, you figure out how things are going to be done, and we're going to, you know, and do that within the limits of our executive limitations, and produce, produce these ends for us. But we didn't, I mean, we're sort of getting into his territory of how it's going to be done if we decide that we're going to take this on. And I don't, I don't feel comfortable or, and I also don't feel that I'm informed enough to make that kind of decision. I believe that cabinet and the administration have more information to be able to make that call. That's where I stand. Other comments from other board members? Does anyone feel differently from me on it? they would like to retain that authority uh, over the decision making? I think we should. Okay, so Brian thinks perhaps we ought to keep yeah. that. I mean, we'll definitely take Lane and the cabinet's recommendations, but I think we should, with input with them and parents and public, we should make the decision. Okay. Others? What do you guys, the rest of you, think we ought to do? I think I tend to hold with Anne that that's an operations issue and that for us it's a, it's a management issue, and a issue and so that to me it falls to the people who know the, the structure and function of the school better than I do. Um, I think as far as public health information, they, I would disagree with Anne that they necessarily know more about that. I think we all have access to the same um, information from the state, public health information is available. Um, but they have the advantage of knowing physically what they can do in the school. And, and we don't have that expertise. I, I, I'm torn, I'm on the fence, um, but I'm leaning towards uh, agreeing with Brian because I don't think that having the final authority means that we already have all the information. I mean, I, I, we need to make an informed decision. There's no way we put a decision out there, I don't think, uh, without understanding from Lane and the cabinet everything we felt we needed to understand in order to make an informed and safe um, decision. Uh, and I think, I think the community is looking to us to have more of a uh, role, and I think this is a, a, an important one for us to take. Thank 
Rico or uh, Ashley? Um, I mean, I'm just listening to all sides here. I, I'm also feeling kind of on, on the fence about this. I mean, I do feel like the board needs to be involved in the decisions that are made, but I don't feel comfortable as the board being the sole deciding factor in what happens because I do feel like the administration understands the capacity of the school and the needs of the students perhaps better than we as a board understand it. Um, so I can definitely see both sides. So I think I'm in a similar boat um, in that I do agree that there is an operational, that there is a governance role in this decision as well. And I do think that that is part of our elected role. Um, I think there has to be more involvement with the board and we are elected by our community to be able to speak to what's happening here. And I think that not having that involvement moving forward puts us at a disadvantage and the people that put us in these roles as well. In a practical way, Lane, what would that look like um, if, if there was some board oversight and you was going to be the you know, expertise of the cabinet and other administration officials that should be you know, involved in making that decision? How would that, how could you see that that partnership would would work well it could work I think it's kind of might be important to talk a little bit about kind of where we are in the decision-making process that went into it and then um, can kind of expand into what kind of because it, it'll kind of play into the information that people would need to be able to make uh, the decisions um, about switching either you know more to in-person or more to remote depending upon what's going on in the community um, a significant amount of time was spent by the cabinet reaching out to the community to get a feel for you know what mode people feel felt the most safe in um, getting started and uh, probably 20% depending upon whether you're at the high school level or at the elementary level said so, you know remote only I'm not comfortable outside of that um, another about 44%, which was interesting because that kind of mimicked what the national averages uh, were across the country, um, said hybrid, and then the remainder was, was for in person. Um, the goal for the hybrid start isn't necessarily to maintain hybrid throughout, hybrid throughout the remainder of the year. It's an opportunity to come in in kind of a safer mode um, to get things started, to build up some trust with the community members, and then if things are looking good, it's to move over to more kind of in person. The other piece that we have to take into account, and this comes back a little bit to the MOU um, discussions, um, is you know what are the staff going to do? Um, there are a lot of staff members who are not comfortable coming into the schools, and if we get into position, if a decision is made to go all in person. Um, and I got a thousand kids that show up and have the staff call out sick that day because they don't feel comfortable coming. We've got a real problem on their hands. Um, and so those are kind of the things that were weighted in making the current decision. That would be vital information for the board to have to know um, in terms of trying to adjusting things from the hybrid to either fully in remote or fully in you know, the biggest one being, you know, what's what's the response going to be from the staff? Are we going to have the people here we need to manage the students that are in the building? Um, other than that, it's um, you know, it's it, it's your gut. It's what the community supports uh, you know, primarily. Uh, recognize that we will always or should always have a remote contingent. Um, you know, depending upon the level, it seems to be about 16% or so um, who will have medically justifiable reasons for not being here that includes the kids and so the cabinet has been doing a really good job of trying to match up the kids that are in that category with the staff members that are in that category to make them fully remote for the year um, so those are kind of the decisions that we but the basic data is will you have the staffing for the plan that you need um, is it safe is it the recommendation of the vermont you know, Department of Health um, right now based upon what the current context is in terms of infection rates in around the um, Unless there's other, other questions on that. I, my question was just what sort of community um, outreach was it? Was it, was it that um, questionnaire that was sent to all the parents about whether they would prefer which modality and, and 
why yeah. and for how many children and that sort of thing? They had uh, two or three surveys that went out, one to kind of help us hone down the questions for the second survey. Um, we didn't get a lot of response to the second survey. We had about 150 families that responded the first time. And so then the uh, principals got together with their teams and actually called um, the ones they hadn't gotten responses from to get a, a better picture of you know, who you know, categorically will not come to school under no, any circumstances, um, who was willing to do the hybrid, and who was interested in the in-person. Um, and that was kind of the breakdown that they said. It was about 2044, and then the remainder was the in-person. Um, and do you have a sense yet for your staffing Sort of capacity, if you know, for how much in person it's, possibilities we actually have? So it all depends upon the memorandum of understanding, what we agree to with the staff. As things currently stand under the CBA, and I, I apologize that this part of the discussion is going to take the humanistic element out of things, which we don't like to do, but under the CBA as it stands, um, the staff have to be able to provide the essential functions of the job, right? So if they say they don't, they don't want to come in, they're anxious, or even if they say they don't want to come in because they've got a, a, a reasonable health condition, um, at best they'll be able to use up their leave time. And at that point in time, once all their available leave time has been used up, then the district can say, hey, you're not able to perform the essential functions of, of your position, even with reasonable accommodations. Um, we got to let you go so that we can get somebody uh, to come in and help us manage these students. That's not a desirable position um, to be in, um, in terms of morale, in terms of the fact that hopefully this passes sometimes in the next six months to a year. We don't want to lose um, good teachers, um, but it's, you know, that's a possibility where things stand right now. In terms of the memorandum of understanding, one of the things that we had discussed in that, uh, that little group was this idea that if there is medical necessity, if you can provide a doctor's note that doesn't say it's recommended that you're you know, not in, in the building, but says it's a medical necessity for you not to be there um, for whatever health reasons um, or, or emotional health reasons that, that a person has, that you know, potentially we would honor that. Now, that said, where does that put us um, numerically? Um, we know the number of teachers that said they're gonna seek that, but that doesn't mean they'll all get it. Um, you're probably talking 16 to 20 percent at the elementary school and probably 5 to 10 percent at high school that would see that. And so then the question becomes is, you know, what do we do? If they are definitely out remote learning, we're going to have to match up kids with them, you know, even some that may not necessarily want to be in the remote learning, learning group because uh, it probably won't be perfect. It looks like a pretty good match at the elementary level from what we know right now, where it's unclear at the high school level um, at this point in time. Try to talk and concentrate with a mask on your face. <laughs> so I, I guess I'm still a little bit unclear about uh, this difference between administrative and board authority on deciding these things. So. Um, obviously, if the board decided to retain that authority, we would rely very heavily on the advice and uh, study of the administrative cabinet. Um, if we see that responsibility, then how are we kept in sort of... Oh, you'll be, you'll be told today. exactly what's going on. Um, same thing with the entire community, the rationale behind why we may be changing things. Um, I think one of the benefits of leaving it in the hands of the cabinet um, is the fact that we'll be able to be more fluid. You know, unless you guys are willing to call a bunch of emergency meetings, hey, you know, we've been at this for three weeks now. Things are looking really good. We'd like to move a little bit more towards the uh, you know in-person um, modality. You know, it would take you know the next board meeting before those discussions and decisions could be made. Um, I might slow things down a little. Or, you know, if we get into a critical situation where, hey, you know, we really need to switch back to remote learning, you know, you guys might be on a 24-hour uh, call and I may have to shut down the school for a day before, you know, we have that meeting to decide that, no, you know, given what's happened, um, you know, infections or whatnot, um, you know, we, we need to go into remote learning for a while. Um, so, again, I think the only, the only real negative um, impact um, 
because more discussion is always good, more minds on a problem are always good. It's just the, the, the fluidity, how quickly we can react to things, the changing conditions. I would just say the board would need to be committed to you know new and special emergency meetings that on a whim. Are there other board questions for Lane before we decide whether we're ready to make this decision? Well, I uh, I mean, I, I, you, you, the, oh, my mic is not on. Um, two, the, I feel like there are two levels, and, and I'm not looking to be micro here about things that I'm less qualified to figure out. I don't think the board should be deciding which students are A and B, and, but I do think that the board should retain some of the authority that the final decision, once we've seen everything that's been worked through with the people who know what's going on, there's something that doesn't feel right about us saying, hands off, we are, we've been elected to this body to help steer the district and in, to my mind, this is probably, in my tenure on the school board, going to be the biggest thing that happened. This is serious stuff. And to take a step back, not even a step back, to completely kind of wash our hands and not have a, a, a horse in the race just doesn't feel right to me. It feels like a shirking of responsibility that I was elected for. I have to agree with Hannah. I think you said a lot of the things that I am feeling too, that this is, you know, we are elected by our communities and we are representing the communities that we are elected from. And, you know, this is such a major thing that's happening within our communities and to our students. And I do feel that, um, you know, if, if there's a time for the board to kind of step up into the role, this is a, this is an example of it. And again, I'm not have any interest in the micromanagement. I just feel there should be some board connection and oversight to it as well. Well, I'm curious, what would that look like then? What, what, are, we, what are we looking at? How are we gonna do that? I've been seeing all the emails that have been coming through. I'm, we just listened again to how they've gone about this I'm listening to what they're doing and I'm not I'm not feeling like oh my god they're not they're not covering something or if we don't have a way to step in to, to stop what's going on they're gonna they're gonna do something that's gonna be a detriment to the to the wider community that that makes up this district I, I'm, I feel the need to be very clear that I, I in no way feel that the board taking authority or re re retaining authority over this decision is somehow in protection of the, the district, that, that somehow there are decisions being made that I personally think are dangerous or wrong, but I also think that we should have a seat at the table and ultimately our signature should be on the, this is how it's gonna look. And it does mean more meetings and it, it, it does mean, you know, taking opportunities to, to go to the MOU discussions and um, taking an active role and, and, and owning what we're here to do. So I, I just really need to clarify that this, me, 
having this opinion, which I said I was on the fence and I kind of talked myself onto <laughs> one side of it, um, is in no way a, a um, because I think that Lane and the cabinet have not done a good job. That, that's not it at all. It's that I feel the board has the responsibility to retain uh, the, the authority to, to stamp it and say, this is what we think is best for our district and our community. And I'm gonna chime in after Hannah, and I agree with what Hannah's saying. I don't see this as a vote of no confidence or a lack of confidence. I just think this is a discussion that is the biggest one probably before us. Um, and the fact that as a governing board, we don't have insight or, or a final approval, which very well would be what's being presented by the cabinet. But to hear that before everybody else on the street hears it, and to understand it so we can speak to it, that's what I'm looking for. That's an explanation that I want. So it's, it's, I'm not suggesting that something isn't being done well. I just think we need to be more included. And right now, it may be more meetings, but I think that's why we're here and why we got elected to this. So what I think I hear you saying is that we are, as a body, ultimately responsible for the decisions made. And I think that's true. And, and the difficulty we're having now is that decisions are made and information is distributed and we can't speak to it because the decisions are made without us. I think it's true that, that whatever decision is made, we're responsible for it because, because we have hired Lane who, who, who develops his cabinet. Um, but I don't think that means that we are in the position where we should be making the decision. One of the possibilities um, is again, you know, the the specifics of how a modality is carried out is more on the operational side. What modality you want, you could make the argument as policy. Um, is you know, if the board, one of the things that might make it easier is the board could restrict itself to the high level. You're a hybrid. Leave it up to us to figure out what hybrid means. Um, and you know, explain it to the board. Um, or you're full in person and we determine the best way to carry that out. That's the operational aspect of it. Or you, you know, you're in full remote. Um, you know, those that's a possibility there is you know stay at that high level. Um, and given the conditions, given all the discussions we've had, the data that we've got coming in, you know, we're committed to you know moving to full in person. Um, you know, what will that look like? pros and the cons of it, you know, are there any operational issues that you see in terms of staffing that might get in the way of, of being able to carry that out fully, and if you can't carry it out fully, you know, how can you move it along that continuum as close as you can get? You know, that's a possibility too. So again, I'm not making a recommendation either way, because I'm not comfortable either way. Um, this is a, one that is uniquely yours to make, make the decision on. Hmm. My opinion is, is basically what Lane just said, is that you know, if we decide the, the higher level, but we still need to have the information provided by Lane on exactly what that those modalities would, would look like, then we can make the decision on how to proceed that. Yeah. I mean, I could come in every month with a monthly, as part of the board meeting, as the monthly recommendation of what the learning modality should be. We could discuss the finer details of it, and if you like it, you say yes, or if you don't, you say no. This is what we'd rather see. But that, you know, could be a, a normal part of the meetings. Uh, kind of so one of the challenges I have with, with that is just that Lane and the cabinet are collecting the information from the community. They are getting the data from from parents and what they need or expect, and and acting on that. And we are not. We haven't been. So getting into this opens up a whole other collection of data so that we can make an informed decision. And if we are just taking what they're giving us for information, then, then 
who are making their decision. It also means we're responsible for it. So we make a decision and we make the wrong call and we wait for the next board meeting. In the meantime, COVID is spreading throughout the school because we don't have a meeting or I would imagine probably you'd get a, have an emergency meeting call that, hey, we've got a problem here or I don't know, if we make a decision and bunch of people, bunch of the teachers don't show up because they're sick or whatever. I mean, I, I guess I, I still feel like that's operational and it needs to be, it's, it's the operation of the school. And, and that's not our purview. It sounds like we have some new board members who, given our policies, want to want to delve into management which if we're going to do that let's start changing the our the, the the policies that that explain how we're supposed to be working as a, as a board because this is i'm very uncomfortable with it i'm much more comfortable leaving that decision making to the administration now maybe we can look at a at an end to that you know I, and it's uncertain times. I mean, no one has all the answers. No one knows what's going to happen. You know, the temperature cools off. We close people into space. We don't know what's going to happen. So it just, I, I, I guess administrators are talking to parents. Teachers are talking to parents. Staff are, are talking with one another and with the administration. I would, I would, I just don't think we need to be in there as another layer. Uh, I mean, we can evaluate how well he's doing. I mean, is he is he treating people? I mean, we have a treatment of staff policy. Is he being fair to people? We have a treatment of parents policy. Is he? You know, are people getting clear information? Are they feeling like they're heard? If they don't want to send their kids to school, can they do that without feeling sort of bullied to, you know, why aren't you sending your kids to school? That I'm okay with looking at, but not deciding how things are going to be going on. I just want to say, to be clear, we are a responsible man. For? For, 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 day what day. for what happens here. Yeah. Not for day-to-day -day operations, but for what happens here. We are responsible, and I'm not trying to shirk that, that part of our duty. What I'm saying is, is, is similar to what you were saying, is that the management and how things actually happen are, are best made by people who are, are boots on the ground. And we've talked about that repeatedly. And the people who can, who can act in real time to changing information and situations. And the people who have the best information and, he, and like you said, he's collecting it from the staff, he's collecting it from the parents, he's collecting it from the community. And maybe we need to know more about what he's collecting so that we can make a better judgment about whether they're making good decisions. But, but as far as making the decisions ourselves, I think, that is, I think that's more managerial. I, I would agree with that. But we are responsible. I just want to be clear that Right, we're, we're responsible for watching his management of it. But he's making the decisions. We've given him that, we've delegated him that ability to make those decisions. Anyone else want to weigh in on this as we come maybe closer to making a decision here? Do you have thought, Gloria? Yeah. Um, I, I, I think, um, I feel like the buck does stop here, that we do have some sort of responsibility for the way that um, the decisions are made and, and that we just feel you know, we're, we're responsible for it. Um, I don't think we are responsible to make the decision, however. I think 
you know, probably, I guess I feel like the administration should, should do their due diligence and recommend, come up with a recommendation, say, you know, this is the way we think we should go forward. And I think it is our duty then to, to listen to that and say, and ask questions, grill him if we want, and then rubber stamp it. Or, or you know, grill him and say, hey, have you considered this or that? Or this is what I've been hearing. Or, you know, I've heard some other district is, is, is handling it this way. Is that something we could incorporate? I guess that's the way it seems to me to make sense to move forward, is that really the administration does the, the work but before the decision is made final, that we say, you know, we, we weigh in on it and, and hear it out, and then, then we're able to speak to our constituents with a more, a, a, just a wiser way about us, because we've, we've grappled with it ourselves and said, okay, this is what I've heard, and this is why they made it, and, and this is how I feel about it, you know? So I, I guess it's more of a hybrid model, um, still holding the administration responsible but allowing ourselves you know the chance to you know educate ourselves about how that was, was made makes it easy man. are we ready to <laughs> vote on this do we want to is someone ready to, to make a motion or do we have further discussion or questions of lane or other points to consider. I mean, my question would be, what would that hybrid look like? Like, would that be a possibility of what you just mentioned, Laura? So to me, I think we probably have to have an additional meeting. But I don't know, how would you so, see that going forward? Like? So again, remember that we are in a position of limited time. And the last guidance that altered everything just came out you know, about a week ago. Um, so they're geared up right now, um, getting everything geared up for a hybrid model. Uh, the main goal when we had that discussion before we even talked about models was that the main goal is the biggest thing that we've got to instill in the community and amongst the staff is trust. Um, that they can have faith, that they know when they come in that they're safe as can be, um, that we're taking care of things, that we're organized, that we know what we're doing, uh, that we've trained them properly so they know what they're doing. And the best way to accommodate that was a hybrid schedule. Um, the goal was to keep that up and running for a little while until the trust was was built, and then to see, you know, if we got more buy-in and more staff saying, you know what, now, you know what, I was a little nervous about coming in. I'm willing to switch over and be kind of an in-person person, person um, you know, to hopefully get that buy-in and, and, and have that change come. Um, but there, there are complexities to all of them that we had to take into consideration. Um, one of the ones is substitute teachers if we're in a full in-person mode. We can't get them. Nobody can. A lot of districts have decided because of the, the complexities of just trying to acquire subs and have them trained and be able to follow all the hundreds of protocols we now have in place um, that it's just, it just was easier to go to remote learning and that's what they did. Um, you know, the, so. A lot of details there, you know, and it gets complicated on the buses. There's lots of regulations around the buses, assigned seats and spacing, and if we have all the kids um, coming in, you know, together at once, we can't keep the spacing on the buses, and now, you know, we might be breaking that trust, because the odds are, if we're going to have problems, my guess is with COVID or an infected individual, it's going to be right off the bat in the first week or two of school, because everybody's been out traveling around the summer. Once school gets up and, and, and running and people are back on routines, again, taking a, a best stab at it, not that it's guaranteed, after two or three weeks, you know, folks have been a little bit more isolated. They're hanging around with the same pods of people as they're coming in and out of school. I would argue it's probably less likely if you can make it through those first couple of weeks to have a COVID case. Assuming everything in the out, outer community stays the same as it's always been. And then you get that trust and you can switch. So just, it's, it's complicated. There's lots of pieces that, that come into play on each of them. Um, and there was a lot of rationale that went into decision making. But they were even, um, you know, looking at some new evidence the other day, you know, should the, should the ABs be, you know, rotating days, you know, A, B, A, B, C, like they were originally planned. And they were thinking, well, maybe it should be an A, A, C, B, B day um, because 
that CDA has fewer kids here, so it's an opportunity to air the building out between now and the next couple. Um, but you know, they had some discussions. They're meeting Thursdays and Fridays with their um, leadership teams within the schools. They've been great with volunteering their time to get the feedback on that. And, uh, last I heard, about two hours ago, they decided that, that pedagogically um, they would rather stick with the ABA rotation. It's, it's ongoing and the information is always coming in. I mean, I will say, like, as a new board member, um, you know, I've never experienced something like this coming on and, and jumping in right in March when all this kind of came on. So this is a new experience for me, too. And I'm assuming that none of you have <laughs> faced this experience before either. So we're all kind of new to this experience. Um, you know, and I don't, I don't know what the best way moving forward is in this sense. I, I think, you know, decisions are hard to make all around, and you're always wondering is it the right decision for the, for the time or whatnot. But I also feel like there's, there's the potential to create even more of a unified front if the board is, you know, stepping in, showing up in that sense as well. So. You know, I, I agree a lot with what Laura said about, you know, obviously I have no interest in making, you know, minor decisions, day-to-day -day things, but I do feel that it's good practice to have the board involved in some way in, in the understanding and then being able to have that knowledge and show that unification, that unified front to our community, to the teachers, to, you know, all the individuals involved. With that potential sort of format of decision making, how, how could you see that working going forward? Um, like I said, if uh, if the, the board retains the the authority, um, it just may slow down the transitions a little bit. Um, the biggest concern, but given the personalities around the table, I don't think it's a really big one. Um, is compelling a modality that we can't staff or we can't, you know, I hate to have the board say, hey, you know, we want you full in person and, you know, we bring that out and roll that out to the staff and start planning for it and half the staff say we're not showing up for that because we don't feel safe yet. I mean, that's a, that would be a problem. And then we have to get back together and say, hey, do you really want us to go through with this um, as best we can or, or do you want to want to change, uh, you know, the mind to something different? I guess I could, I mean, I would, and I'm speaking for myself because I don't know how the other board members feel right now, but I, I would see it more as you saying, this is what we're thinking about. We're thinking about you know, this hybrid modality and these are the reasons and these are the considerations and this is how busing is going to work. And just sort of laying that out so that we, in a, in a way that we could ask questions and become clear, you know, as far as, you know, why why is this going forward like this? And what are the, what are all the eventualities that you've considered in making that decision? That then makes it easier for us as community members to reflect back to the people who ask us the questions because there are plenty of questions and just say, yeah, these, this, is, this is the thinking behind it. These are the reasons. This is how they're going to, you know, change the way the, the education was handled last year and, and augment it and these, you know, it just allows us to speak more knowledgeably to our neighbors um, and, you know, and we, I, I don't know, as, as a board member, I'd then be able to say, yeah, I feel confident about the way this decision was made, the way it was, you know, the, the information that was generated to behind it and that sort of thing. No, I, I think, like I said, that, that might be the possibility that, you know, we come in and we do our monthly recommendation to the board based on where things stand. Because that would get into the details behind the thinking process of, of why, you know, these are the reasons why we think it should stay the same as it is, or these are the reasons why we think it should change, and the, the planning that would have to go into it, the details that we'd have to pull up. But that would keep people, I think, pretty, pretty well informed um, on the thought process. I don't mean to dominate this conversation here. I feel like I'm kind of dominating tonight. But um, I agree that would be nice. Because often my husband who gets the emails from the schools knows what's going on more than I do. And, and that would be nice. But I think the drawback of that is that it slows, it, it reduces our agility as a district to, to respond to what's happening in real time. If we're waiting, 
they're waiting for our rubber stamp each month, or even if we call a meeting, it still is going to set the set decision a few days at least. So and that's, you, that's one of my concerns. Yeah, and even well, they're having trouble hearing you. Is well, your mic on? It was yeah, it? I turned it on now. Great. Sorry about that. They, um, you know, one of the other things to just kind of remember too is the. There's the work that I'm engaged in, there's the work the cabinet's engaged in. We do a lot together, but a lot of it's separate because our contexts are different. Like the COVID-19 plan book that came out, that was, was me um, working with the cabinet pulling all the details in. And there's some pretty specific things about how we've got to operate given the directives and the health concerns that are out there. Um, and so I'll be able to easily talk about things at that level, but how that gets interpreted when you get to Braintree versus RES, you know, they have to take those protocols in and they have to put their own specifics on it that, that fit their school. And so that may be a little bit different. So, you know, the conversations that you'll be able to, to get out of me is the, the more high level general, this is, this is what we've learned about the community, this is what we know about the staffing levels, this is what we know about, you know, the health, crisis in our local area right now and this is why you know we're recommending you know this model um, these are the complications that we would potentially face and these are the benefits of it you know that would be easy but if you want to know specifically what's happening you know all the details in a specific school that would require you know one of the principals coming in yeah they, they should all be coming in through through separate doors to minimize you know um, congregations as much as possible you know if you want to know the details of how they've set that up and who's in which door and you know, I don't think you want to go that, that deep into the weeds, but you know, those are all details that have to be worked out. I would say, again, your husband is getting the emails from the schools. And, and again, that should be a reassurance to the community that they, they are thinking about things, they've been open with if you have questions or you have concerns, you want to know why we're doing things, contact us um, I I live in a residential area I see I walk my dog I have not had any parent come up to me and, and be really concerned I, I, I take that back I had one who said uh, she was gonna have her I, she was gonna have her husband call the school because he knew something about HVAC and he went, but I mean, I never, even if we were to hold on to this uh, ability to tell them how, to, how we want them to open, I'm not going to, I don't think you're going to have that kind of level of detail for me to be able to respond to that community member. And I'm still going to have to say, call the superintendent or call the building that you're concerned about so you can find out what kind of filter is on your HVAC equipment. I'm not going to know that, and I don't think it's my 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 duty as a representative on the school board to know that level of detail. My duty as a, on the school board is to make sure I've got people in place who can respond to people who have a call and can do it in a polite and timely manner, so that the community member knows what's going on and can feel confident in in the administration and I think one of the ways we show that we're on board is we've we've hired him we've trusted him to manage his people and to be to do that well and they've made if they've made the decision to do this I feel like all right then I I trust that they can do it that's that's just where I think I trust that they can do it too. And I also think that every member of this board should be able to provide as much reassurance as the school without having to provide information on the HVAC system. I'm at swim lessons every day, and every day I have parents of elementary school children, that's more my community, concerned and wondering when's the next communication gonna come out, how do you feel about how this is working, how was that decision made, what went into it? And I. I cannot provide the level of reassurance that I feel I should be able to. And part of it too, I think, is um, it's important where possible to connect those folks with us uh, because we do have the details. Um, and so it's hard, it's hard to respond 
um, in general, you know, and we hear, if I hear a community member saying, well, we don't feel like it's been communicated well enough, well, it's, it's nice to be able to sit down with them and say, hey, so what are the parts, we've communicated a lot, but what are the parts and pieces that we're missing so that we know? Um, in detail-wise, the principals right now, they're working out the details that are specific to their schools. The last week of August, they will each be doing an online open forum. Um, so they, the goal is, is they get their details worked out, they get the, the email communications out to uh, the community members and the families so that they've got the paper copy, the written copy, and then uh, late August, they have the open forums to come in and ask the specific questions. Um, because remember, the principals are still working on the details that are related to the building. They know what they have to do, but there's a lot of specifics that they've got to do. Um, so there is a communication plan out there that's that's pretty well pretty well detailed. Yeah, and, and the handbook was incredibly I mean I did say to a couple people, did you get the handbook? They said yes. I said, did you read it? He said no. So and and I did so that I could understand the details as a parent. As a school board member, I think that we should have on on a high level a seat at the table and if we want to call it a rubber stamp then that's what it is, but Yes, this is what we is has been recommended to us. We have complete confidence in the administration that they've come up with a plan that works. So we are approving this plan. I think that that would. Um, I think the community needs that from from the board. I, I think we should um, we should be ready to own it. And I'm like I said, I'm I got no recommendation for you because I'm comfortable with the way. So if again I've said this in the past, don't worry about me. I know the cabinet will wish that it, you know, a little bit more control, but it, it also depends on the level of control. I mean if you're looking to micromanage, I'd say no way. Um, but that doesn't that's so not what I'm here. Yeah. So um, someone just I'm I'm reading the chat so some people pick up when two of us are unmuted, it echoes for people, so yeah, we got a, got a, we'll have a better system hopefully next month if the equipment comes in. It's taken a while to order things. Are there any other board comments or questions? Um, are we ready to make a motion? Um, or do we need more for discussion on this?
emails out to us about it. So, but yes, he could choose to, to uh, not tell us what's going on until he tells the parents. I will just say one other thing. We do have other policies about how he's managing that would allow us to look at that if we, if, you know, if we, in, in, in our monitoring reports. Um, Are we ready for a vote on Ann's motion? before it goes out to the community. As a unified front, the superintendent, the administration, uh, and the school board has made the decision that it'll look like this. And, and in that model, how do you ensure its timeliness? Uh, we call special meetings. I mean, I, and, and I don't think, I don't know what's gonna happen with COVID. I don't know how often we're gonna have to change this modality, but I hope not every month. I hope that the, the teachers aren't going to have to be changing things. Maybe that will happen. But if it's in the middle of a meeting cycle, if it's in the middle of the month, we call a special meeting as quickly as we can. I don't know how much notice, legally how much notice, if it's 48, if it's, I think it's 48 hours. 48. 48 for, in terms of, yeah. 48 for special, but emergency you can do with as much notice as possible. Okay. I think we have to be, I believe we, we need to be ready to do that under these circumstances. Are there other questions for Hannah around the, the gist of this motion before we hold the vote? Yes, I just quick clarifying. Mm -hmm. um, this has to be a full board. There couldn't be like a subcommittee that, that meets for this. It has to be a full board. That's good.
the administration to, to, uh, to use? It, it, in, in this hypothetical situation I have in my head, um, they would be presenting what led them to that particular recommendation. Results from a survey, it, but, but not the, which students are going where, which doors are gonna be used when, but what, um, why they're recommending it. And, and we can ask until we feel comfortable voting yay or nay. Can I have a question? Also, mm -hmm. Can you imagine a situation where you would disagree with the recommendation? Right now, no, because I have full confidence in them, but I can imagine myself having concerns, sure, and, and putting questions to them. I, 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 I don't feel like I can really answer that, although if I felt really uncomfortable and that it was a dangerous um, trial to put uh, the, the school community through or the children or the, or the staff, I, I wouldn't vote for it. But the majority could still approve it, right? I mean, right? It would be a, a motion and a vote. Decide, say, if um, you know, were to go all in person and the staff member wasn't comfortable and refused to come in, could we force them? Um, yes, and no. Uh, again, they have sick leave, they have leave they could take, they would have to provide medical documentation um, to us to say that it's warranted. But in the end, once the leave is used up, if they are still unable to come in, even if it's for a clearly legitimate reason, the way that things stand right now under the CBA, um, and under ADA and all the other laws that are out there, they have an essential function to perform that we are paying them for. If they are unwilling or unable to perform that essential function, then we terminate them and we hire someone who can because we have a job to do in front of the kids. And again, this is taking the human side out. This is not what we want to do. This is not the position we want to be in. But that is how things would, would, would unfold or could unfold uh, currently. Yeah. What about a parent didn't feel comfortable coming their child to school? And, and we were saying, well, you, in this model, you've got to send your child to school. Can it, can, what's, What's there is, happen? you've got the truancy laws and things that, you know, technically, you know, would come into place. But one of the problems historically with Vermont is that the courts don't bother with truancy. Um, you know, so, you know, even if we wanted to force them to, we'd have to go in front of the court, have the judge, you know, get the parent in there, order them to do, and tell them what the consequences will be if they don't follow through on a failure to send their, their student. Uh, but again, the courts typically have not invested time in that process. Um, they don't, want, um, don't have the time for it with the other things that they do. Um, so that would be difficult to do, and I wouldn't be comfortable with that. Nora, by the way, was asking if she could um, pose a question. I just saw the chat. I'll leave more of that it's up, up to you uh, allow her. Uh, sure. Just, just make sure you unmute, Nora. Sorry. Um, so Nora's asking if she could pose a question. Um, go ahead and pose it.
up, up to two years. I think the second year you have to apply and be approved for, um, but that is correct. But again, that would allow us um, the ability, and again, this is not what we want to do. We're just talking the, the inhumane aspects of things. Um, what that would allow us to do is, since we're stopping paying that person, again, with a fixed budget, I now have that money to apply towards hiring somebody who can come in and perform, and, and, and again, willing to perform the essential functions. Um, yes? But again, that's you know when the person has has used up all their leave. Yeah, I'm not speaking to whether I agree with this or not. I just wanted to clarify that point. Oh yeah, no, nope. understood. So I guess my concern about Hannah's uh, motion it really is is it just seems like it's going to be really clunky. Like it's going to be difficult for decisions to be made and the school to move forward in a way that's reasonable, really. You know, that, that you know, to educate us, inform us, and then for us to go, you know, before they're able to move ahead the way they would like to. So I, I don't know. I, I feel a little uncomfortable about that. Can we, can we have some type of like a, a emergency um, provision that Lane can make a quick decision if it comes down to that and then, you know, but I, I suppose we can have a board meeting within a, a day or two, depending on uh, um, anything, but if we have, you know, if Lane has like an you know, emergency management um, privileges that he can change stuff and then get approval in an emergency situation. Yeah, mo the most likely situation that would happen is we get a, a couple of COVID cases and Vermont Department of Health says, you know, you guys should be in remote learning right now. Um, what could possibly happen is because I don't have board approval to move to remote learning, I would have to close the schools for the day so we lose a day of learning that counts against us that we may or may not get a waiver for. That would be the that would be the most likely kind of scenario I could see kind of playing out. Um, Lisa Floyd had a question if the, the board is willing. Lisa, go ahead. I see you have a question. Yeah, I think they're good points. Remember, we're coming, part of it too, from the board's perspective, I don't know, um, but remember, we're in the summer season, you guys don't typically meet in July, you know, so you, you're relying on whatever emails that I send out to the community, I usually send them to you first and then the community as well. Um, but that may be part of, you know, how people may be feeling right now is because those July meetings don't, you know, don't typically happen. So we're just starting to get geared up. And you're coming in halfway through the, the, the planning process and stuff. want to reiterate that I don't see this as a question on the ability of Lane or his cabinet on making these decisions. I think to what Lisa Floyd just mentioned, to me it just comes down to communication and it comes down to having an understanding of just how the decision was made. Um, again, I mean, I have no interest in getting into the weeds of some of the stuff that was suggested earlier, um, but it's just the overall global 
how how did we come to the decision of a hybrid model for Mondays and Wednesdays and Tuesdays and Thursdays? Because like everybody else in this room and probably everybody on this computer, we've seen that every school has done it different. So how how come we chose this? And I don't know. I don't know. And maybe I'm not, maybe that's okay that I don't know, but Again, I go down to, as a governing board, that lack of understanding. I'm not asking for eight more meetings. I'm just asking for better communication to us to know how that decision was made. And that's where my hesitation in turning full authority over comes from. So, and that was in one or, one or possibly two of the communications that went out. Um, it was for pedagogical reasons when they had the discussion about it, um, trying to allow the kids the opportunity to work remotely, come in and get immediate feedback the next day, work remotely, immediate feedback. Um, that was the goal. Um, when you have the two days close together, the AA and then the DB, um, you're getting multiple days off without that feedback. You're getting more days off without feedback than, than other. So that was one of the primary kind of motivators uh, behind that um, discussion. But again, it was a focus on the learning piece of it. Again, I will, we are gonna, we have a monitoring report for this month's communication and support to the board. So if you have some feedback, as we evaluate this monitoring report, we need to give that to Lane. Because that's where we do that. We do that in these monitoring reports. We say, look, we need, I, I need as a board member more information. But I don't think sort of deciding to come in and, and take, oh, take on that, that operate to me it's still operational um, what what's going to be happening in the school and uh, I just I just don't think this is the place to do it I worry that we are comparing our school's abilities to react in real time to information because of for, for kind of almost, almost selfish reasons because, because we want to be able to answer questions that come to us from community members and it's about, it's about us seeming like we're informed and looking like we have control when really nobody really has control here. <laughs> and, and, and we're taking back some semblance of control by, by, by asking for this ability to rubber stamp what's happening. I, I can't think of a, a time when they would come to us with a well thought out plan and we would say, no, we, we want everybody in school. Or or no, we think you should do it this way. I don't I don't think we're going to I think this is it seems to me I worry. I worry that, that this is about this is about us as individuals and not as not about making our school district as strong as it can be. Well, part of, part of it too, I think, that needs to be balanced a little bit. We can talk about that. When we get to the communication limitation. Is you know, at, at what point should you be referring folks to administration or teachers? That you know, when people have questions, that the teachers have the information for, the administration has the information for. I mean, uh, yes, you should definitely have general the general gist of things, um, but I think there's a lot of good to handing them over to the people that have all the details. Um, uh, you know, that, that is a part of, you know, one of your policies there is that, you know, when, when those things come up, they should really be sent over to talk to the people in the know. Um, again, those are all, all board policies. You guys can shift them as you see fit or as you feel a need to. Um, but that, I, I wonder about that as well. You know, should you be fielding those big Depending upon, I don't know what the questions are asking. So, but should you be fielding those those big questions and those detailed questions anyway, or, or should that be left up to us? And maybe this is an easy place for me to sit because because I'm not getting those questions. I live remotely, and 
fairly isolated setting. I work out of town. So I'm not getting the same pressure you are. I, I feel the need to clarify the question thing. I, I, it, to, to me, actually, that's not why I think this is so, it's, you know, that's not the primary reason I think this is so important. And, and I can't give you a specific example of a question because it's more anxiety that I'm getting. It's not, it, it, how are they gonna decide who's in grade, group A? Or the, it's, it's anxiety, it's unrest, it's discomfort that we're all feeling. Um, the, the words, I, I share that, that that should be a concern. It's a valid concern if this is about us as individuals or wanting to maintain some control or power. I, I um, would put forth the word responsibility. I don't want to have to, to, to um, be the one to say all kids should be remote or all kids should, or staff have to show up and you know, be damned in their anxiety. I feel it is our responsibility to take part, to have, um, a, to take on the risk that this poses, to take on, I'm sorry, I'm speaking just to you. Okay. <laughs> it is our responsibility on this board to have that decision have not just Lane's signature on it, but our collective signature on it. I, I feel really strongly that that is a responsibility we need to hold. Um, so it, it, I wouldn't say it's a want, to have a say in that decision, I think it's it's a it's a duty. It's it's part of what I think my role is here to um, to to own that decision as well. My, our our name should be on it too. I am interested in who suggested that if there is an emergency situation and the Vermont Department of Health is recommending that we go full remote, I would feel comfortable if I'm allowed in my motion to have a provision that that would be that that, that would be under Lane's authority. So we don't lose a day of learning. So you don't lose a day of learning, and we get the kids safe and staff and uh, uh, administration safe as quickly as possible. Can you repeat the motion now, Linda, please? Well, um, before, it was just um, the, she moved to retain authority with recommendations from the superintendent and cabinet. You could have the, and the recommendations from the AOE or whatever you want to put. Uh, the Department of Health is where I'm going to come correct? From a, from a, from a, yeah, that's what it is. If I'm going to have to close the school because of an issue, I'm going to have there say so. Would that do it for you guys? I feel well quoted. Yes. Any other questions um, as we think about coming to a vote here? Anything else we should take into consideration? If you know, if we vote to approve this motion, Lane, how could you see this sort of unfolding as you and the candidate go forward in, in making decisions? It's not going to change anything in our decision-making process. Uh, let me turn my mic on. Sorry about that. Um, it's not going to change anything in our, our decision-making process because you know we we have to go through that anyway to provide you with a, a well-thought recommendation. That, that portion of it's not going to change. We still collect the data, um, take a look at, like I said, the biggest thing would be staffing, staffing ability and staffing levels, and you know, go from there. <clears throat> they did um, ask for the motion to be uh, read so that folks could hear. Um, okay, somebody up to repeat it. I can repeat it if you speak it to me. Okay, so it is um, the board uh, retain authority with recommendations from the superintendent and cabinet and the Vermont Department of Health. The board will retain authority um, in terms of learning disposition 
um, you know, we'll take recommendations from the superintendent and the Vermont Department of Health. And cabinet, yeah. And cabinet. On the recommendation of the of the Department of Health, without Switch, switched to remote learning as opposed to having to close. Yes, that's right. That's right. Yep. Thank you for clarifying. Yep. But is that correct? With recommendations from the superintendent. Some, some sort of emergency provision yeah. for um, you know changing due to immediate circumstances or something like that. Are you saying we need to change that? <laughs> we need to add it. Okay. Right, I would just say that Lane has the authority to respond swiftly in an emergent situation as directed by the Vermont Department of Health or Vermont Agency of Education without prior or approval. Okay, so we're adding to this thing. Okay, so Lane has the authority to respond to an emergency situation. Okay. By changing learning modality on the advice of the Vermont Department of Health. And then for me, you know, the only the only thing that I would be doing is rather than close, we just immediately go into one session for those days. Any other board comments or questions? We need to clarify before we vote here. Okay, if not, um, so we have this motion, um, which has been read several times. Is everyone clear on that? Okay. Um, so it's time for a vote. Uh, all those in favor of this motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Right, so the motion clears. The motion carries um, four, five to two. All right. Um, on this topic, Lane, um, do you have more to say about how the school is going to move forward in these next few weeks? First of all, before September 8th and then after September 8th. So now you guys are in the unenviable position of deciding what the learning modality is going to be for the start of school. No, we're not. We're, we're listening to your recommendation yeah. right now. We want to know so what that, planning yeah. you've done, what preparations so far have been made, and so that's where we are. We want to hear what the cabinet and you have decided. So again, based upon survey data um, from community members uh, and the ones that did not respond, they were reached out to directly by a phone call. Um, survey data from uh, the staff, um, as well as a couple of open forums that happened um, with the staff. They settled in on the hybrid modality for a variety of reasons. Um, primary one was establishing a sense of trust with folks. Um, secondary uh, to that was they were very committed, especially up front as part of establishing trust, of making sure that they could maintain the six foot distance um, because that's the primary um, means of transmission. You know, contact, it's still questionable about how frequent there's actual transmission through contact with surfaces that may be contaminated. Um, but what they really worry about is air quality, and the biggest thing to protect people from those uh, aerosolized droplets that are in the air is maintaining that six foot distance. And so the only way, given the numbers that we have, um, in terms of students of being able to maintain that six foot distance was to get half of the kids out of the building. Um, and so that was a primary consideration to going into the hybrid mode. Um, once they decided on the hybrid mode, then the considerations were, okay, how can we manage learning? You know, what's the best way to split this up? You know, the DAB versus the AABB. And again, we kind of touched on a little bit about why it was the DAB rotating um, days. Again, it's to give the opportunity for the kids to get immediate feedback after a remote session. Um, right? um, one of the big things pedagogically, um, especially with the younger kids, um, 
it's actually true with all kids, but especially with the younger ones, is new information um, that they receive, they retain it the best the first time they hear it. So they're going to retain it the way they, the first time they've heard it. If they get it wrong because they're looking it up on their own, and then we wait a little while before we correct them and try to set it straight, it almost is impossible to change that initial learning of the material. Um, so it, it's very critical to have the, the, the students get that feedback as fast as possible. Um, the other pieces to take into account was um, the idea that under the hybrid schedule, we might be able to run two sub-modalities. Um, the first one is, so the main body of the district is under this AB hybrid schedule. Um, first sub-modality is we'll also be able to run, run full remote learning for those that need it, right? The teachers that have medical necessity, students that have medical necessity, they're their own little subgroup. We can match the teachers up with the students that need it. They can be over here doing their, their thing and keeping themselves um, as safe as possible, you know, given whatever conditions that they may have. Once we get up and running under the hybrid um, system, if we're running under it for a while, um, we'll have a better feel for what staffing is like, for you know how many students are arriving every day, if anybody's dropping off the radar, and potentially starting to match up um, some students to be able to come in for uh, four days straight, you know, Monday through Thursday. Those would primarily be um, to start struggling learners, um, students on IEPs that really just can't advance in the curriculum uh, without that closer kind of one-to-one -one contact. And then, you know, if conditions permit, you know, expanding that in person more and more. You know, we envision it as having, you know, several kind of gates to get through. You know, if we've got a limited amount of resources, then we're just focused on, focused on the high critical need um, students um, that, that struggle with learning. Once we've got all those, guys and gals covered, then we can move down to, okay, we've got other students that just didn't perform well um, with remote learning at all last year. So even though they're in a hybrid, they're still going to be suffering a little bit because remote learning is not a good learning uh, strategy for them. So those ones we'll try to bring in, you know, four days a week as well. So that's kind of how the plan was set up to kind of unfold. Um, the remote some modality we can do right off the bat. Um, we're already doing those matchings. The elementary principals are doing a really good job of that when I talked to them today. Um, whether we're able to get a subgroup of students that are coming in four days a week, um, you know, that, that remains to be seen. We'll be able to reassess that once things are up and running and we know how things feel and, and how they work and we can collect some data off of that. Um, the other piece with the hybrid uh, is again, fewer folks here. Um, less possible contamination, less exposure, potentially if we have a student who comes in who is infected. Um, it allows us to keep our, our cohorts, our, our, our groups together, or they call them pods, you know, you try to keep the kids all together with the same people all day as much as you can. Um, we'll allow for that. Um, the C day uh, originally was intended to have everybody out in remote learning to facilitate deep cleaning. Um, you know, over the weekend. Um, we can still get the deep cleaning done, but what we've decided to do is that that C day is for juniors and seniors. They will be primarily remote learning. Um, they're older, they can handle it a little bit more. The health risk is a little bit greater for them if they're exposed. Um, so if we can keep them in, in remote as much as possible, and then have them come in the one day a week, which is on the C day, which is on the Friday, right? Very limited number of students that will be here uh, between the junior and the senior class, um, getting the, the direct instructional help that they need from the teachers. Um, but it will also leave the majority of the buildings open for the deep cleaning, right? The elementary schools won't have anybody there. Um, so it doesn't really hinder things too much. So there are a lot of, lot of thought and effort kind of went into the plan that you know, we're putting in place for the fall to get things started at least. And then the hope is after things get settled in for three or four weeks and again, people are feeling comfortable. Um, you know, if it looks like things are safe, we can start to move along that continuum to full in person if possible. And when do you anticipate knowing uh, about your staff and who's going to be available for in person learning? So, right now, what we've got is we've got staff that are reporting. Um, you know, I'm a staff member who is going to be seeking a, a, a note of medical necessity. Um, 
doesn't necessarily mean they all will get it, but we're taking their word for it as we're doing the planning right now until the next minute. Um, one of the things when we get to the memorandum of understanding discussions is one, we still got to talk about you know notes of medical necessity. Um, two, because we may be having unexpected staff doing remote, people we didn't expect there, it means last minute we've got to do some rearranging of the current staff. You know, somebody who thought they were going to come in and be teaching second grade this year because our, um, you know, third grade teacher needs to be out for remote, we may be having to move that staff member into a grade they didn't anticipate for, which means that those days that we talk about at the beginning of the year, remember the, the governor has pushed off um, the start of school for in-person instruction for kids until September 8th. Those days um, become critically important for those teachers to be able to do their planning, right? I was, uh, all summer I was gearing up for second grade, now because of these changes, um, to accommodate things, um, I'm now gonna be teaching third grade, I need three or four of those days um, to get the planning done, um, to be able to, to switch into this new role um, that I'm gonna be experiencing this year. And so we actually even have the days now because of that 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 change to be able to provide that for them, uh, which would be appropriate. Any questions? And how about RPCC? How is that going to run? Um, they are looking at a straight AB schedule, um, no remote learning. Right? Doesn't really fly with um, the needs of the students um, that attend RTCC. They're there because they want the instructional component, but they want the hands-on component as well. Um, so they're really trying to stick um, as strictly as possible to a straight AD um, schedule for the students. I have a question. You've been going on about this. The, it really, it sounds like the limiting factor has always been your staff. What about the actual education of the kids? I mean, I personally did, my son had a, an awful experience this spring. And so that's really where, and, and I've heard from you know my group of people that I've talked with, and they felt the same way, that the, the, the remote learning was not adequate. So that's what, where I'm really getting at is, it sounds like this whole hybrid is all really geared towards the staff and what about the best education for the kids? And that's part of why the, the memorandum of understanding is important because they do have a right to have a say. Um, that is part of how things are structured you know, across the United States uh, with, with the unions and whatnot. They do have a right to stay. But the biggest thing that's going to get them here and allow us to do more in person is for them to be able to start off, feel comfortable, feel that it's safe. Right? The second that people feel that things are safe, they're going to be willing to take a little bit more of a risk. And you know, as, as difficult as it is, you know, we all want things to be perfect. We want you know, learning to be exceptional. Um, there's, there's no doubt about that. This is not a perfect situation. The best we can do is the best that we can do, unfortunately. Um, and so we're fighting these two competing needs of, of safety and, and, and learning. Um, you know, and then you gotta decide where you, where you come down on that. Hopefully we get everybody back to school and the, the rates stay as low as they have in Vermont and we know the safety piece is taken care of and then we can focus more on the academic. Um, but again, this is the, the starting mode, just that, that mix. Um, gives people some practice in both the remote, gives people um, the in-person instruction that tends to be much more conducive to learning. Um, and hopefully gets people feeling safe in the buildings. You know, that we're all stepping up, doing what we need to do. The cleaning's happening as, as has been promised. Um, people are wearing their masks like they're supposed to. Um, they've got good practices down for, for sanitation. They're coming through midday every day, wiping things down like they should. You know, once people see that that stuff is happening, hopefully they're going to feel a lot more comfortable. But you do have a significant number of kids that don't want to be here. Uh, the parents that don't want their kids here. You know, it's, it's 16 to 20 percent. It's a it's a high percentage. It's two, 200 kids. Uh, so it, it adds up. But no, your points are well taken, and, and they, you know, they they hit true. Uh, but again, it is it's it's balancing out that the safety versus education. 
up front, we're better off being a little bit on the safety side so people feel comfortable and get some trust over yeah. At least that's the goal and that was the, the thought process. Are there any other questions from the board for Lane at this time? Lane, do you have anything else to add? No, I think uh, I appreciate the process and I appreciate the thoughtfulness of, of the discussion. Okay, so I'm going to open up this, this up to public comments or questions um, since uh, perhaps some of the people who are listening in might have a, a question for Lane or for someone else here. So um, feel free. Usually our public comment, um, we are not able to take any action. We certainly can clarify or answer, definitely answer the questions. Um, we do ask speakers to limit their time to about three minutes now. All right. Feel free. I don't want to turn your speakers up, but you can ask a question. Yep. Sure, go ahead. Okay. Um, sorry. So um, I appreciate the conversation you're having, and um, these are unprecedented times, and uh, I think everybody's doing a lot of good work with great intentions. So. Um, I teach at the tech center, I teach construction trades and management. And, um, so I really appreciate the fact that we're going to do juniors a few days a week, seniors a few days a week, and then um, mostly remote um, companion classes like a fourth year English and some math and science mixed in. Um, it's a, it's, I think it's a really good plan. It just, um, uh, I just want to kind of point out to everyone that um, we're a very different I have 16 students for five and a half hours a day. And when you split them almost evenly, seven and nine, um, I'm in a shop being 60 by 60, I can keep that distance in. What I'm trying to illustrate is the difference between me and say elementary or middle school teacher. It's, it's significant. I also think um, they're young adults. They drive, often drive themselves to school. And when you split that, cohort in half the juniors and seniors you can keep them um, busing is easier because only if half of them take a bus half of them drive and the work-based learning component really gives them a rich four days in program two and me two on a job site for a senior one day of um, remote i think it's really rich in my class i don't have the same challenges you all do but when you decide on if COVID was to come back and we got cautious, um, to, to be able to treat different models differently and have that be that nimble, it would be, it would be very, I, I, I hope that you consider that the tech center with me in a shop with seven other students and they're not traveling from class to class every 45 minutes or 30 minutes, they're with me. That we can that we can look at different models differently. Um, we're a very different animal, primarily uh, juniors and seniors with a, just a small uh, number of uh, tenth graders involved. So I appreciate all the conversations you're having and all how you're trying to adapt to every situation. I just want to just illustrate again how different the, the, the tech center is and. and if things were to change at another level, we could, we might be able to stay the same. Just consider. Thank you. Please, you want to comment on that? Yeah, no, I, I, I think, um, you know, Tim's comments are, are important. Um, you know, the best scenario that comes out of a, a situation, if one arises, is that the faculty talk uh, directly with Felicia. Felicia brings it to the cabinet, and then we've got all the best ideas on the table for how to proceed, and that, that would be the goal, um, is presenting a recommendation to the board, um, is taking all that information into account. Recognizing very clearly that, um, you know, even though we've got three elementary schools, you know, their contacts are completely different, too, because of their sizes and the access to the resources that they have. So very good comments. I appreciate them.
uh, Christina Dina Cole, I think Mike. Right. But I don't see your thought. Yes. Yeah, you are. Ah, okay, sorry. Um, yeah, that's the Yeah, the goal is, again, it's, it's to get a start, it's to build some trust. The goal is to move towards more in-person if, if conditions allow. Um, it's not necessarily to stay in hybrid all year. Um, that, that's not the goal. Um, you know, the, the overall goal, if, if conditions allow, is to get folks back as much as possible. Um, the counseling team, I know Beverly's um, on um, as well, um, has been t attending a lot of meetings, but they have um, planning in place, and they've done some communications um, with the community as well about how to access uh, resources both within the school and out of the school if issues are going on so that we can connect people with the help that they need. And those communications will continue. Uh, but I share the concerns that you have as well. Um, it's a lot easier um, sometimes for us to be identify what's going on, especially in cases of abuse. Um, because typically, you know, if the, the student's restricted at home most of the time, uh, that's not something a parent's going to report on themselves. Um, so it is easier uh, for us to recognize it. Uh, but no, the intent is um, to get, get things up in a nice, nice healthy start, hopefully. Um, get people to have some trust and some faith that what we're doing is a good thing. And then start to adjust things um, as conditions allow, um, hopefully, the more in-person instruction. Does anyone else want to make a statement or ask a question? Um, I would like to, it's uh, Vicki Johnson. Um, I don't know if anyone spoke to the possibility of having an AA BB model or AA cleaning day BB model um, before. I know that it was, I kind of came in a little in the middle. Um, we had discussed that. Uh, as a possibility uh, in the high school department leadership, and I think it makes sense to do the same thing district-wide. Um, and uh, I understand why pedagogically they might want a, you know, some might want a B, a B. We had suggested um, moving to an AA cleaning day B, B model um, just to sort of help separate the cohorts a little bit. Um, if, you know, someone were to get ill, uh, it would be easier to trace you know, from, you know, teacher to student where that's happening and there would be sort of two days of exposure with one group of students. They would have then, you know, five, five or six days to develop symptoms or get better and get tested, that kind of a thing. Um, and we can separate the four ways. Um, so I just wanted to mention that rationale for, it, for another, another possible uh, model for the hybrid model. Yeah, the, um, the principals actually brought that, sorry about that, reading chat at the same time. The principals actually brought that up at the last cabinet meeting um, at the end of last week. And uh, what I told them was, um, you know, I'll support whatever it is that they decide is best. Um, and said, you know, you guys have till Wednesday to hash it out and tell me what it is that you want to do, um, you know, it's just got to be consistent across the district. Um, what I heard today, I have not heard um, from Elijah and Katie as of yet, 
Um, what I heard today is it sounded like those meetings happened and they decided to stay with the AB, um, AB um, schedule. But they did have a pretty rich discussion about that at the last cabinet meeting and then they got together as a, a cabinet, as the group of principals, to kind of hash out the benefits and, and um, the pros and cons of the two schedules and to come up with a, a, a final decision. Um, so that'll be finalized on Wednesday. My understanding right now is that they're still sticking with the, the ABAB. Anyone else want to ask a question or make a comment? I'd like to point out that we can put a question in the chat. I didn't see it. Let me see. Do you want to read it, uh, Rachel? Sure, sure. Do you predict that the school district will move to less than a sixth of distance before a So the goal, again, we talked about the goals of the hybrid schedule. Um, primary goal was trust. One of the best ways to establish trust is to stick with that six foot distance. That was a primary reason for choosing the hybrid schedule was so that we could continue that six foot distance. The intent is, you know, barring some new information or some new science, um, some new ideas that come out, the intent is to maintain that six foot distancing. Um, right now, you know, what the research says is, uh, you know, the contact, can you pick it up from contact? Probably. Um, but the real way that you pick it up is by breathing the droplets that are suspended in the air. And the best way to protect against that is the six foot distance. And so that's what our intent is to do, is to maintain that. Again, um, can I guarantee you that'll always be there? Um, if the science changes and says that there's better ways of doing things, um, you know, we'll consider it. But the intent right now going into things and for as long as we can foresee, unless the science changes, is to maintain that six foot distance. Anyone else want to ask a question from anyone who's listening in? Both um, emotionally in their, that emotional time, in that 
intellectual and academic time, just creating the space and for, for proper uh, middle school development. Lastly, we talked about, and it's, this is sort of the overarching goal really, is, is bettering our role as a board with engaging community. And necessarily, um, the strategic plan, that's what this entails, is community outreach, community involvement, community engagement in developing and, well, first of all, determining whether these are the proper goals for the district, and then in working on developing and designing the way we hope to attain them. Um, is there anything else someone else in this uh, group would like to add as we start to consider where we go next with the strategic planning discussion? It's really, this is a 2021 to 2024 project. Um, we need to launch it, you know, sooner rather than later, by the beginning of 2021, so that we can, these are things that we plan to work on and accomplish by the uh, end of 2024. Um, how do you feel as board members that we should be moving forward? Next 
do not remember how the last strategic goals were defined or designed. And do you remember? Um, well, we did, we've never done them before. Yeah, yes, we have. We have? Yes. Um, the, the last goals, I, I don't know. Maybe I wasn't on the board. You were on the board. And it was done in 2016. I was on the board, too. But I'm embarrassed to say that I was had no part in developing the goals, and I don't remember them even being developed by the larger board. They I were. think I think they came from Brent. I think they that was Brent. Okay. Yeah. So if they indeed came from the cabinet members, um, really, according to the VSBA, this is our work, um, and so then obviously this is a new process for us and. Um, as we move forward, you know, we need to figure this out ourselves. How do we want to better define the goals? Do we want to see if these goals are representative of what others within the school community um, think is the most important for us to focus on? We're not limited to three goals. We can have more. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think maybe that's the way to start the discussion then is what are our goals? Are these just because it seems amongst this group that those are things we found compelling. Um, perhaps, you know, really none of them, none of them focus on the elementary schools. Is that something that we're missing? Um, and how do we want to frame this discussion? Do we want to hold this discussion in a community forum? Do we want to involve first the staff of the schools to say, you know, these are some, some goals that sort of seemed relevant to us, are these the most pressing or the most uh, worthwhile from your vantage points? And if not, what else should we be considering? I'd love to hear how the rest of you think we ought to proceed. We're in one of the groups, and we had written out what we had done, but we mm -hmm. not find it. Oh, or, I need yeah. to look at the yeah. Okay, what does he say? Um, Elijah asks, this may be an inappropriate time to ask, but how are board strategic planning goals different from ends? Which are typically how we at the school level are guided by the board for what is important and what we are what we need to share evidence of achieving. One of you want to take that on? I'm sort of forwarding this. I don't know how to answer that. I mean, there's a difference, but I don't know how to articulate that. I, I, can, I can try, but I don't <laughs> want to put words in the board's mouth either. Um, no, te technically, they should be the same. Um, in terms of the strategic plans and the goals that are there, they would typically either be um, a part of the ends, or they could be the sub pieces of the ends that must be accomplished to achieve the ends, if that makes sense. Um, I found in the past that what most, um, I think they've done a couple of ways, what most boards have done in my experience is that there is a communal process to kind of develop what that strategic plan is, and I can talk with you about, you know, what I've seen done before. And once you've hammered out your three to five goals um, that you're going to work on for the next three to five years, or that we're going to work on together for the next three to five years, is that they send out kind of a survey vote um, to the community, to the, to the staff, um, and even to the students, you know, are you in support of this being important enough for us to invest our time and, and, and budget on for the next three to five years? And then if you get back and 85 or 90 percent of them are saying, yeah, this is really important to me, then you know you hit it on the head. If, you know, 20 or 30 percent say this is important, then you know that's probably an area you want to look at again. Uh, but, yeah. But to answer Elijah's question, I would argue, yes, they are the ends, um, or they are, are pieces um, that get you to one of the ends. And if memory serves me correctly from our discussion at the last meeting is that um, as a board, it felt like a lot of the work we were suggesting be the focus is already happening. And 
it felt like, again, we go to that middle school discussion. I mean, that's something that's brewing right now. You mentioned Lisa's role changing um, to respond to that. So what I see us is that as a board, we're solidifying the commitment to that process of, of looking into that. Um, you know, looking at the feedback we've received about the culture in the high school, the board is saying our goal is to see an improvement. So to me, I think that it is um, elevating those as being our top issues that we want to see success in the next three years. And you, you may need to change your end statements or if they end statement or if they fit into your current end statement um, what it is is it's also an admission that you know there's a lot of stuff there that needs to be worked on can't do it all at once these are our priorities for the next three years and then once we get those where they should be then we move on to the next next piece in our list uh, as a possibility So Rachel, how were you suggesting that we proceed? Um, what would you like to see us do? I don't know what the next steps are, but I feel like we need to take the next steps because mm -hmm. otherwise we're stuck in this cycle of talking about it every time and right. not actually accomplishing anything. Right. I think my one concern, or not concern, but my one question to the board kind of is if we, if we come out to the public right now and say, what are the things that you want the board focusing on? You know, these are our kind of what we talked about strategic plan. I think my only concern is that the community not feel we're trying to take away from the focus of what's currently happening and the most kind of prevalent issue right now. Um, so that, that would be my only way of how to approach that in a really mindful way to present the community so there's no feeling that obviously COVID and the response and, and how the school year looks is our main priority as a board and, and, and you know what we're discussing but these are things that we need to look for for the future um, and have in place so just that making sure that's a really mindful discussion and, and presentation to the to the community. Yeah, I mean, many of them right now seem like moot points because, you know, every all three of those things are not going to happen even as usual, and we can't even contemplate um, thinking about differently structuring them. Um, perhaps we, I mean, I think, I think we could make subcommittees to work on each one. Those, of course, will also, those discussions will also ha happen in public session, but it seems to me very important that we first check in with everyone else, meaning particularly staff um, and students and or community. So it seems to me some sort of community forum would be the best way to just sort of discuss where do people want us to, to envision the school moving. And you know, it, on what would they see the best way for us to put our focus. Um, I don't know how to envision a community forum right now or even in the next month, so I, I, I really don't know uh, the best way that we can be productive in, in moving this discussion forward with a larger group. You know, the only, only question I come up with, with that is, is it, is, opening it up to staff, faculty, parents, teacher, community. Is that going to end up being like our survey was, where we have, you know, 50 other ideas and not focus on the four that we did? That's, that would be the only thing that would, if we open it up now, you know, do we limit it and say, you know, these were our thoughts, what are your opinions on these four items or you know, do we open it all up? Just, and then, you know, I can just expect that we're going to get, you know, 50 different opinions and priorities, and it's not going to get us any further along. So, 
I don't know if we should do another session to, to try to really um, maybe get more detail because like I said I don't think we I think we were rushed at the end of that meeting that we had and, and a couple of a couple of the topics never really got discussed between us so I feel that we would have another meeting whether it's you know um, after a board meeting I know I would hate to stay that late but um, or, or or have a you know, another retreat meeting with just the board to to further that before we go to the public with them. How does that, uh, I don't know, I'm asking, how do, if we're going to have another meeting to sort of hammer out what our goals might be, um, how does the, how does the open meeting law apply? Like, I, I don't know that we yeah. can have, I don't know that we can have a closed meeting. I mean, we had a, our retreat was. Mm -hmm. We did, and I don't think it, but I don't think it was technically a closed it was, it was about development. Uh, you, were, no. you, you can find out an answer to it. You've asked it before, but it's one of those things that comes up sporadically, so you don't, don't remember. Um, the big thing is if you're together as a group and you're discussing things that might lead to a decision down the line, that's a problem. Right? Uh, so, you know, if you guys are talking about goals, those are that's something that the board would have to agree and make a decision on down the line that should probably be an open meeting. As I remember for training purposes, there are exceptions, you yeah. know, but I'm not sure a second meeting around this would fit that category. Yeah, if you're starting to hammer out something that might become your policy, that's, uh, that's an open meeting. Right? I do, sh I, I want to get things rolling. I want to feel like that was uh, well, it was a productive meeting and that it's moving somewhere, but I do share Katya's concern that, you know, September is not the month to go to the school community and say, are these important, we know COVID, but are these important to you too? I just, it, it's, I think, being strategic about um, where people's uh, heads and emotions are right now is really important. I know we want to get the ball rolling, but I I just don't think it's the it's the moment. It's the season. I think our strategic plan expires though. I mean right. We need to have something. Yeah. Twenty twenty the end of the year. Yeah. yeah. So we need to have something and this is just the beginning of the work. Mm -hmm. And we have well, you know less than six months to to develop this. I agree. I agree. You can't you can't go to the community and say this is what we're thinking about, and not say, but we're also thinking about. You know, you kind of have to lead with the biggest issue. But I think in that whole conversation, there's a way to do it mindfully. If if the board puts out some sort of, you know, communication to the community and says, you know, we understand this is the situation right now, but at the same time, we still have to move forward as a board on long-term planning. And so we will be starting these discussions with the community in the next few months, you know. So I think there's ways to just let the community understand and kind of gently introduce the idea of it and still be able to move forward. But I do think maybe a communication from the board saying, we acknowledge the current climate and the current situation of things going on. However, we still need to move forward with you know, long-term visions and plans for the school through our strategic plan, which expires. Therefore, you know. I think there may be room for us as a board to communicate more directly with our community anyway. Um, I know there are other boards that each time they have a meeting, you know, we have minutes and people can find our minutes, but, but most people aren't going to go looking for our minutes. Um, but to put out a communication this is what we worked on this is what we're thinking about you know each time we have a meeting I don't, that's more um, publicly palatable than reading through minutes might be might be a good way to help people understand our work mm -hmm. that's a great idea 
Blaine, I think you had mentioned at a, a previous meeting in June um, that it would be possible to get with the IT department about the, the board having a board email address so that messages came directly from us that or you know or from yeah. Porch Forum, Laura, when you post in there, it's very you guys, clear it's from You guys just have to decide as a board that that's what you want. Okay. You can set it up and you know you decide who you want to have access to that. And then they can send those emails out to anybody in the community that you want. And I, it's it's a real simple program. I mean, five minutes stops. Yeah, and you, yeah. I think it would be important that it came from us and not from Lane. Mm -hmm. I almost wonder about like a blog on the website where we just had like these are the couple things that we talked about, and these are the answers. This is what we're looking for. Quick blurbs, nothing that's really in depth. And then maybe at the end, and then maybe at the end, reminding people how to make their concerns known, or what, right. the, what the what the process is to bring concerns mm -hmm. to the school system. And just so you know, and I think we touched on this in the strategic planning session. Um, everything that you hit upon, if you're worried about whether or not it will connect with the community, these are the common patterns that have come out of all the open forums that I've had. So you're you're on the right. Mark for the most part. Yep. So I'm hearing several things that, first of all, you know, a communication, um, <laughs> a communication that's more succinct and uh, more sort of palatable to um, the interests of our constituents. Um, that could be both on the website and in other forums, you know, maybe the paper and the front porch forum or something like that. Um, so one of us would have to write up those um, for dissemination amongst everyone as, as widely as we can do it. And, you know, asking for input or ideas or opinions. Um, and so that we'd have to have a, an intake way as well, whether it's an email or a, some other forum. Um, was there another idea besides those, the blog and the, the communications? I mean, I think, I think Katja's idea of sort of putting it forth that yes, you know, we understand and we're, we need to further our own mission by, by continuing to, to work on a strategic plan is important. And I, and I agree that we just can't let this simmer, even though it seems really sort of tone deaf to be working on this right now. So does someone willing to take on that chore of writing up sort of a abbreviated version of what we talk about and, you know, sort of soliciting comments or, or input? I'm happy to work on board communication, but I would love to not do that alone. <laughs> I think it might be good if we took took turns, like maybe maybe the person who does the the board evaluation, and like have a structure for how that's rotated through our through our group. Mm -hmm. um, and then that person can say this is what we talked about. Because it would need board approval before it went out with the board's name on it. So you write it up send it out to the group, you get responses within a couple of days. It would need to be, I think it would need to be pretty timely. You wouldn't want to wait two weeks and then, and then get it out. Mm -hmm. You want to get it out within a couple of days. We had, a board, we had a meeting Monday night, and here's, here's what we talked about. And here's when our next meeting is, so we get right. And here, if you have your concerns, is how you address them. Yep. And how would we receive comments or questions or input? You can direct to our board email. Or we can send them through the, through the, I don't know that we'd necessarily invite it directly to that because it's going to come to one board member or whoever checks the email to address. I think it would need to go through the, through the policies we have in place for people who have concerns, right? Which is, well, like there's no. a hierarchy that's, that's described in our policies. No, but I'm saying someone oh. says, hey, I'm, I'm wondering if this or that might be a better strategic policy. Or strategic, you know, have you thought considered, like, I'm not saying that they need to go to the oh, principal yeah, or the yeah. teacher or the 
So you're just saying more of like an acknowledgement when information is received. Is that, and say, you know, and we'll, we'll share this with the group? Or a response? I guess I don't understand. No, I guess I'm saying, so we're saying, so this is what we talked about and these are the ideas we have as potential uh, goals for a strategic plan. You know, if you have questions or comments or suggestions, where then does that, do, do those flow back to us? How, how is the best way for us to receive those? I think would have to be at the next board meeting. I, what I thought we were, and maybe I'm misunderstanding, but talking about was how to communicate out but not necessarily the intake. Because okay. this is where, you know, the public comment is kind of where the, the, the intake, and we have email addresses, that people, but getting a, an email address or sending out messages is so that the board has a voice to, um, to the community. Yeah, okay. that's what I thought. And in those email exchanges, it could also have every exchange has a little bit at the bottom that's like, you know, monthly meetings help, you know, just have the general information of how to contact your, how to contact the board, how to participate, participate in meetings, just that's on everything. So it's pretty self-directed and how to get where you need to go. Yeah. Okay. Um, so can we then agree as a board that we are willing to take this on and designate one person each month to be doing those information blurbs. I, I just wonder if that's a good use of our time. We've got Zoe on from the Herald. She's, she's listening to the meeting. She's here every meeting. We've got Television How, who are we going to be con who are we going to be getting to and again let's remember that parents are one subgroup of the community the, those that's not the whole community that's that's they are the customers of the of the system and they are community members but there are other people as well and they get a lot of communications from the schools. You get it through the newspaper. And if if you're interested, you're you're gonna be reading it. I just I just wonder I, as a parent. I mean, I get so much information that it's just like information overload. So I I just wonder. I think when we really want to know what people are thinking, we, we should have control of that process and target people. Because again, who are you going to hear from if you're, well, we've sort of changed a little bit. Now we're just saying we just want to get more information out to people. Is that right? That's the purpose of it, is to just give more information? Or are we also trying to solicit information? I see that the purpose as increasing communication between the board and the, com the community in general, staff, parents, community members, um, and, and helping to build a bit more community involvement with the school. I mean, I think if we almost to build buy-in from these community members and parents, you know, I think that the more we can make people feel that they are involved in a in a group and in a community the more they feel they have a voice the more they feel they can access information that's needed i think that as as we see you know telling someone to go to a website and find meeting minutes that might not be accessible to everybody um, or they may be intimidated they might not know how to read minutes or what you know what it means and i i think personally it can be very you know, overwhelming to read something and be like, I don't, I don't know what this, this says. So I think if we can provide communication in a really like quick, succinct, like this is what we talked about, here's ways to get, in, you know, more information or if you want to get involved, if you want to attend a meeting, making it a little bit more comfortable and just trying to involve that community more. And again, I think a big part of it is the buy-in. I mean, wouldn't it be great to have more parents and more community members turn out to things and 
discuss things and create more vibrant discussions around stuff. So I think that to me is like, if we can get that communication out there and make it more accessible to more people, that's better for everybody. spending time delving into the, these strategic goals to the ends. I mean, we still aren't really clear on the ends. When we have these ends, but they're very general. Um, and, and I just feel like we, we go around and around the actual work that needs to happen. We get sidetracked on we need to communicate better. But I, I, I think we need to focus a little bit more on on really you know what what is it that we we want to have as outcomes and monitoring I mean I'm hearing people we, we've had people say the communication hasn't been good enough to the for the board well let's let's look at our monitoring reports and maybe we need to tighten up our policies maybe we need to change things around a little bit so that people are are getting what they need but I just I'm not sure having a communication out to, I, I guess I, I'm not sure what that's going to, what we're going to gain from that. Well, I guess what I heard, and perhaps I'm wrong here, but what I heard it was a beginning of a discussion about strategic planning and then sort of feeling stymied by the fact that we're, we feel a little bit like we're doing this without knowing whether we truly represent the community of which we were elected to represent. Therefore, you know, we need to maybe solicit information or um, validation that we are actually moving in the direction that our community wants us to move in. And, you know, in sort of this question of, okay, so how do we best do that? And one suggestion was that we communicate more and better with our community, um, our larger community. And one way of doing that would be making people, letting people know what we're actually doing in these meetings and perhaps soliciting their involvement through the next meeting. Um, you know, that's a long progress towards accomplishing what we want to accomplish. I understand that. Um, we certainly, you know, there could be much better ways of going about that. You know, I'd love to hear what you think we ought to do to better our community engagement right now around these, you know, this specific chore or task of strategic planning. Well, I, I'm wondering if we want to do some focus groups. So let's, let's, you know, I don't know. And again, we're dealing with COVID, so it makes it awfully hard. But we invite a few so that we get a real cross-section of the community so that we, we, we get a better sense. Because when you, when you just blanketly solicit information, you hear either accolades or you hear criticism um, and and it's usually from a, a certain segment of the population and I think we might want to be more strategic in how we go out and get information so let's and, and again maybe we use um, you know the senior center or the Chamber of Commerce. So we, we, we target 
the groups that we want to go and maybe we even just say we want to we want to have a Google meets with you and hear from the chamber about what they feel is important for our school district um, many people have mentioned the realtors so they're dealing with people moving into the community so maybe we have a Google meets with realtors and see what they're telling us about about our school district and how it's uh, perceived or, or what they're hearing from people as they look at the community as a potential place to reside. Um, rather than trying to just, I mean, you can, you can try and entice people to come to the meetings, but the other thing is, is I know in the past we've encouraged people to come to the meetings, people come to the meetings and it's like, why would I want to come to this meeting? It's really boring and you're not talking. So again, that's where I want to make sure that we're, we're asking them to come to something and they, and they, and they want to know where they, you know, they, it's a little bit more targeted, I guess, is, is from the past. Because it's just, it's really hard to get people to come to things like, like this. We've been trying for a long time. I mean, the whole time that I've been on the board, we have had trouble getting people to come give us input. And what we've heard from many trainers now is you can't sit in the school and, and try and get people to come here. You've got to go to them. You've got to do the reach out and, and go find the people and, and target them, because otherwise, you aren't going to get the feedback you're looking for. I do think, though, that you know many of those groups you mentioned, many of them don't know the school very well or at all, and they really they have no idea what our strategic planning objectives should be. You know, they have some hearsay or there's some that. I don't think it's really a very realistic way to do board work of like strategic planning. Um, I, there's lots of people on the meeting tonight, you know, and, you know, in some way, you know, of, of uh, getting their collective wisdom around where we should be going now. It's, you, you, you could argue, and you'd probably be right, that it's not a representative sample of the larger community. These are people, staff, parents, who are very interested in the well-being or the furthering of the school. They want to know what's going on and they're sitting through this boring meeting, you know? So we already have a very select group, but they're also invested, invested enough to sit through it. So, you know, I think we need to do a better job at engaging those people, as many people as we can, to, you know, to help us further this work, our work, their work. I think that's our challenge. And I think you're right, you know, it's, we're not very efficient. <laughs> we spend ages talking and debating round and round about everything. But I think that's often the way that consensus works, is it's really not a direct path at all. It's involving a lot of different voices that, you know, and you want to hear from everyone, and then you want to sort of come up with some sort of clear way forward that everyone feels okay about. You know, and it takes a lot of time. And yeah, so I just don't think it's cut and dry or easy work to do. So I have a suggestion. Do we want to put out some type of a preliminary kind of where we're at with our strategic plan? know kind of put out those four ideas that we had talked about and then plan on doing a you know uh, kind of a working meeting with the board and I guess it will have to be you know a public meeting but really have it just designated for to 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 further those four items you know we can put something out now to tell let people know that that's what we're where we're going and then we may, even if we have to do a special meeting, 
to, especially if we're going to do it remotely, that would be probably easy for everyone to, to log in and, and discuss this a little further. But that would be a, another step to take but instead of spinning wheels and, and getting something done. I also think if we could just formalize that timeline, I think that would be helpful for me, or the process, just to understand, you know, this is ultimately our goal, but the process to get there, so we know, is it months, is it weeks, um, you know, how is that information going to be shared? I think we just need, if the folks that worked with us last month could provide that overarching guideline, to me, I feel like that would be a good starting, a good second phase for us. I can reach out to Susan um, of the VSB and ask how, ge how generally that, mm -hmm. you know, that process works and what the timeline is. You know, I would propose that we'd be done more or less by town meeting, you know, because there's going to be board turnover then, you know, then we can start, you know, the new board session with a set of goals that are further defined mm -hmm. and, and ready to sort of begin work on. So, um, and I like Brian's idea of, you know, setting either aside time, say at the end of the meeting, still public, but you know, where we could sort of start hashing out and hammering out, so, so further defining exactly what we, what we mean by these goals and how we could achieve them. I know we wrote down, you know, we, that, you know, they need to be specific and clear, they need to be measurable, you know, actionable, et cetera, you know, so that these are things that we feel confident that we want to prioritize. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so perhaps that's going to be, you know, I know next meeting is going to be long. We've got a lot of reports from the principals, et cetera, um, how we did last year. You know, so, you know, whether we need a special meeting at the end of September or we want to put this off until October. Um, I, I sort of think we need to do it before then. So Laura, the, the principals are going to be talking to us about how this past year went, how they did meeting our ends, so that it sort of dovetails. I mean, we can use that as an opportunity to hear from the administrators, um, you know, what, what do you see? What do you see as the professional educators, the leaders of an education staff, what do you see as the things that we really should be focusing on as a system? That would be great input, I think, to look at and to incorporate into a strategic plan. Um, you know, what, what, what is that showing us about how we're doing as a system? That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. So let's make sure that that is part of next month's discussion, you know, because I think that would be very informative for us, you know, to, to use going forward. And perhaps we can, if we have time, we can schedule a working um, discussion about strate strategic goals at the end of that meeting. Are there other decisions or discussions you want to have before we move on? Are we willing to commit to uh, writing up some, some sort of, um, I don't know, easily accessible description of our work each meeting? Is that something you're willing to do this month as evaluator, Rachel? Okay. And so we will try to define that a little further um, and see if we can, you know, realize that goal. That seems very manageable to me as a way that we can be more transparent with um, our community. All right. I feel confident that we are able to move on. <laughs> um, next is the first reading of an electronic communication policy. This was something um, that was part of our agenda. We saw, we were emailed it through Lane a few days ago, I believe. 
Um, Lane, do you want to talk about this? Yeah, this is, um, came out of an act in 2018, um, and it's part of kind of preventing the exploitation of children. Um, the VSBA got together with the Agency of Education to put a model policy together about communications between, oops, probably should turn my mic on, communications between um, staff and students uh, through electronic means. Um, it kind of defines what inappropriate communications are and um, requires that there be some sort of formal process in place um, for folks to register a complaint and then charges the superintendent with developing a protocol um, to manage the investigation and the eventual disposition of, of what that report may be. Um, so it is required under statute. Um, easiest thing to do is to use the VSBA recommended language for this because it's already been vetted um, by multiple organizations as well as um, legal. Do you need us to approve this? So this is, uh, would be a first read, um, just so that it's out there for the community, and then the next time we meet, it'll be back on the agenda for an approval, um, unless there's questions between now and then. Yeah. Okay, um, let's visit this next month. Uh, people should look it over before then, please. Um, as I mentioned at the start of the meeting, we are gonna table the discussion of the Equity Action Committee for next month. Um, next we have, oh, I do have one other board management and governance, and unfortunately that's to report that Paul has resigned. Um, he is no longer able to fill his, his position on the board. He is uh, doing a, a master's, to, uh, he's in the second year of his master's, uh, MBA, and full-time work, and just does not feel like he has the time to commit or to give. So um, that's sad news for me. I've really enjoyed uh, working with him. So uh, that does mean that uh, Randolph will need to appoint someone to fill the rest of his term. His term expires in March, so that's basically a six month term. Last time we advertised that opening and uh, we received resumes, and read them over and we, we talked about them and then um, suggested a few names to the select board, but they were the ones who actually went through the appointment process and appointed uh, the person to replace our Randolph person. So, um, Linda, if we could put that vacancy in the paper and advertise for um, you know, a short-term, six-month school board representative, that would be great. All right, so moving on, we've got EL monitoring. Um, this is the first read of two reports which Lane submitted, 2.0 and 2.8. Um, they were in our packets this month, and we will actually uh, approve them next month. But uh, Lane, would you talk about those, please? Yeah, so um, uh, executive limitation 2.0 is probably the easier of the two. It's the shorter, it's the global constraint policy. And really what it's about is ensuring that, you know, at the district level, at my level, that we're preventing um, any members or organizational practice from violating the law or commonly accepted ethics and practices. <laughs> I'm reporting that this is in compliance. Um, we do quite a bit of human resources work uh, through central office with things that rise to our level. Um, there were 11 employees that were discharged. Um, there were 20 investigations into claims of staff misconduct that were done. There were 19 investigations into student misconduct that made it to the, the central office level this last year. <coughs> All staff issues were resolved without grievance. Um, there were two issues that made it to the board level. Um, and the board supported the findings um, indicating that the superintendent acted properly um, in those actions. So I, I report compliance. Um, you guys had the bus route issue that came here, and then <coughs> concerns about the treatment of a, another person's student. And I apologize for coughing, it's allergies, it's not COVID. <laughs> it happens, it comes on for five minutes, then it goes away. Questions on 2.0? Hi, 
How does this compare to other districts? I'm just curious. This seems I had uh, put in just out of curiosity to try to put some longitudinal data in there in the report. I actually was doing a comparison of each of those to last year. Some were up, some were down. I think the students were up and then the staff, the staff ones were down. <coughs> it would be hard for me to say. Um, two of the districts that I worked for previously had a human resources person who managed all of this. Um, the one district that I was in was much larger um, where I did a lot of that work. Um, and it was probably about on par, um, but again, they were a, a larger district, so you know, begs the question. And 2.8? 2.8 is communications and support to the board, and this is uh, all about just making sure the board is getting the information it needs for its decision-making process. Um, the one kind of thing that I talked about a little bit was in provision six on the ends. Uh, and this has kind of come up uh, a couple of times. I think it would be helpful if they receive some clarity from the board in terms of the interpretations that I've settled on for the ends. Um, some have stated that there's other data that, that may be more important than what's presented. And so it would be helpful if the board just made a clear statement of what it is to add to that or or um, to change, um, and maybe that'll probably come out, it'll be made a little bit easier, but come out through the strategic planning process that you guys are engaged in. <coughs> I've been looking at a lot of academic-based um, data and performance, but if there are other things that people feel is important, um, it'd be nice to have, to have that input. It's gonna be a quirky year anyway, um, because we don't have the regular testing data to rely on. It was never administered last year because of COVID. Um, we will be doing some of our own internal testing at the beginning of the year. <clears throat> and that data will give us some indications on uh, academics. But not all the details that you're, you've been used to. Are there further um Further background information for both of these in the OSSD office, or uh, the most of the stuff on uh, EL 2.8, um, you guys have seen 90% of that here anyway. Um, so I would argue that if there are things that you want to see that you feel is important, in, in addition to, I'm happy to provide. Um, the uh, 2.0, I sent you a confidential version, right? Uh, because a lot of that dealt with uh, personnel matters, student matters. Um, so you have that information, and if more is needed or more is desired, just let me know. I'm happy to provide it. <clears throat> but they are also in the office. Yeah. So to be clear, you want you asked us for more guidance on 2.8 number that, six. Number that, six. That's my recommendation on the ends. Um, what happened when I I started in the district for those uh, folks that are new is that. Um, Folks complained about the data dump. Um, Brent would give a large amount of data in a big packet um, that touched on a variety of different things. A lot of it was subjective data. Um, so being new, when I saw the ends for the first time, I said, well, heck, I'll just treat these like I do the executive limitations. I'll interpret what those ends mean in terms of you know educational parlance and what seems to be important in the world today and then choose the data that goes along to support that that's, that's objective. And a lot of that focused primarily on, on performance data. The board over time has mentioned that, you know, there are other things that might be important to look at too that, you know, provide a bigger picture of the school and the district as a whole, but I've never gotten clarity on what those things might be. And so that would be helpful. To be honest, the academic data you're going to get every year anyway, just because you should be aware of, of how the kids are testing um, on, on the, the state tests, on SATs, on the AP exams. Um, so that there are other things that the board feels is more pertinent towards the ends that you've established, I'm happy to start to collect that data and provide it. Um, that would kind of flesh things out a little bit about the overall health of the district. Um, but again, board's ends, our job is to try to meet them. It's helpful to have some clarity on what it is you think shows progress towards them. So since he's asking us to do that, maybe we can make a plan to do that. I mean, 
we need to be, this needs to not be something that we hear about and then just sort of forget about. We need to make a plan for how we clarify this provision for him. Mm -hmm. And that's to help your work. I mean, I'm happy to continue providing what I'm providing, but if, if the board itself doesn't feel it's completely serving your needs, then just let me know. Um, or if you've got some general ideas, I might be able to put the specifics on it for you um, as well. I know, Anne, you've been the most frequent critic of uh, Ling's end reports. Um, do you have some suggestions for them? I, I personally have felt pretty comfortable with them, but I know that you think they're... I don't know, well, I just... I, I, what I just... What I've been looking for is sort of similar to what we started to do with some of that strategic planning is not just a report of where we are, but okay, this is where we are. This is where we're shooting to be. And, and that hasn't happened yet from this superintendent to the previous superintendent. And, and that's what we need to be working toward is saying, okay, here we are. This is what we're targeting. This is how we're going to measure it. This is why we think this is important. And then, and then we get that result back. And that's where then we go back to the community and say, okay, is this, you know, this is how we're doing. Are we on track? Is this where we want to be headed? Is this, is this working for people? Um, and, and we haven't really done that. I think, in, I think in his asking for clarification here, he's saying he hears you, and he right. wants to do it the way you want it, right. or the way we want it, Let's, but but what do we want? And we right. need to be very clear on that. The part that I have difficulty with is, I don't know if it's realistic to say, okay, 100% of the kids will be proficient. Yeah. I don't know if that's a re so that's where I throw it back to him and say, no, you've got to come to me, to us as a board, and say, this is, this is where we're at, this is what we're shooting for, and this is the rationale for why. We're using this test, this is the reason we're using this particular test or these test results. Uh, this is why we're shooting for 80% and not 100%, which I would imagine is good, not going to be 100%, because there are some reasons why. I would imagine that we're not going to be at 100%. Not, not, nothing is perfect. So, um, but that should be in a, an ENDS report. You know, this, was, this is what we were targeting. This is where we came in. We're still going to continue to target this. This was the reason why we didn't quite make our target goal. Uh, and, and that hasn't happen. Now that's on testing. There are other things to look at. Uh, we have the induct, uh, IRCs from the tech center at the elementary level. You know, we've got to dig down and say, okay, this is where all fourth graders are going to, you know, this is where we want our fourth graders to be. We're going to use this test, whatever, so that we can kind of be tracking how things are, are going and what our target is. Because otherwise, every year it's sort of like, yeah, we're doing great. But it's like, did we meet our goal? I don't know what the goal was. And, and I don't think we can make the goal necessarily. I think we need to work with him to, to have him say, no, nope, this is going to be our goal, and this is the reason why it's our goal. And this is how we're going to check whether or not we've met that goal or not. And, and that's a that's a give and take process. It involves the teachers and the administrators and the, the head manager. So there, just to, what may make life a little bit easier is I can send out the last two inch reports. Um, the one from two years ago was probably 35 pages long and went into all the details, including setting goals and dates for completion um, to be done. And again, people didn't seem happy with that piece. So everything that Ann is asking for was there. There were some ends, um, admittedly, that the success of which, I was trying to find the best way to describe it, the success of which is determined by not having evidence, right? In some cases, you know, yeah, you know, we want all students, you know, the base, basic goal for the academics is 70%. Is we want 70% of the kids hitting the proficiency threshold. 
um, and there was a, a lot of detail that went into explaining you know why the 70 percent was a, a good choice at the time but there were some of them in there that were really the ends were just so difficult um, because uh, proving that you met them was kind of having a lack of evidence as opposed to being able to provide evidence mm -hmm. and those are the ones that really need clarity <clears throat> So it might be worth me sending around, especially the original one that had all the major details in it, um, for people to just rip apart and give me the critical feedback on um, what you're missing, what you need. That would be helpful. Because um, I, I love playing with the data. It's fun. Uh, and setting the goals. But uh, I'm happy, happy to send that out to different folks to take a look at the feedback. So it seems to me since we've got a month before the time that we need to accept this uh, monitoring report that we use that time to further refine our expectations of Lane so that we can better stipulate what it is that we want him to do each year. Does that sound fair to you, Anne? Yeah. Okay. So Lane, you're going to send us out this. Yep. Um, so I'll we'll send the one from two years ago because that one, the that one really explains all the details behind the decision making at the time, and I think that that will get a little bit more into. So if we all have the data, then do we talk about it at our next meeting? Because we shouldn't be conducting a lot of business. No, via he's going he's to just email that to us, yep. and then we'll talk about next month. I'm not on here. Even on here. Um, so he, he'll email us those documents, and then next month having thoroughly reviewed them, we should hopefully define what it is that we want from him in the future as far as uh, ends reporting. Okay. Good. Uh, we will, this is our chance this month to read over both of these reports and then we will accept or reject them next month. Okay. Next is our consent agenda. Um, I would like to approve them as one. So we've got minutes from the June 8th meeting minutes from the, uh, the, June, the July 13th meeting, um, both included here. And lastly, we've got professional contracts, a list of uh, people um, that we have decided to hire. I signed their contracts. We just need to approve those. I make a motion that we approve the consent agenda, um, all as presented. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? All right, the consent agenda is approved unanimously. Next, we have the superintendent's report. Lane, uh, would you like to add or comment on anything that you've included in that report? Um, if there's questions, I'm happy to. There's there's one or two pieces that, oh, sorry about that. I'm happy to answer any questions if there, there are any on the superintendent's report. There are one or two pieces that will play into kind of what we discuss in um, executive session um, that are in there. I have a question, mm -hmm. and it's actually on the principals, uh, the elementary school principals report. Yeah. Um, and my question is, how come um, there is not free breakfast at Brookfield for all the students, like there are the other schools? Well. They're the wealthier district. There's a certain threshold in terms of free and reduced lunch that you have to have to hit um, to be able to get that, and they are have, they don't have enough in the okay. free and reduced categories. Um, it's kind of the same thing with title funding. Um, title funding is meant for disadvantaged students, um, and typically, you know, wealth is the main way of measuring that. For, mm -hmm. Brookfield typically doesn't meet the threshold to be able to receive title funds, but because the rest of the district does, the majority of the rest of the district does, um, is above that threshold, I can apply for a waiver to be able to use those funds across the entire district as a whole, including Brookfield. Um, but yeah. Yeah, if, I, if you didn't ask me right off the bat, I could, I could tell you the numbers there. They're probably in the 30% um, rate where you need to hit 40 or above. Um, poverty rate of free and reduced to be able to, mm -hmm. yeah. It just really struck me mm -hmm. when I saw that. Yeah. Any other questions for Lane on these reports? How about the financial report? 
Um, some of that we'll talk about in because it, it's good, um, but there's some strategy behind it. Um, we'll talk about in executive session. Um, <clears throat> we ended things um, very well. Um, there weren't any concerns uh, kind of going through things. Um, even the food, you'll see we ended up in the black. We were getting a little concerned the last time I talked with Robin. We were 53,000 down because of all the extra um, food that was going out during the days that we were doing the distribution um, and trying to get the reimbursement to kind of cover the staffing that was required for that. Um, but no, we're, we're in the black for the food even, which is unusual. So like I said, we'll talk, we'll talk surpluses when we get to, get to executive session. Any other board questions on these reports? Okay, Rachel, it's time for our evaluation. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So on general meeting behavior, uh, the agenda was well planned to focus on the real work of the board. Um, Gave us, we met acceptable or above on everything. Um, the board followed its agenda, did not fo allow itself to get sidetracked. I think we followed the agenda, we didn't hit the time marks, but we, sta we stayed on track as far as what we were discussing. Um, so that was acceptable. The meeting was well attended, the board was prepared for the meeting. The meeting proceeded without interruptions or distractions. The board's decision making processes were understood and implemented appropriately. Diversity of viewpoints were sought out and considered. Participation was balanced. Everyone participated. No one dominated. Um, members all listened attentively as each participant spoke. Board members avoided side conversations. Meeting participants treated each other with respect and courtesy. Work was accomplished in an atmosphere of trust and openness. Right. Right. Governance, governance principles. Um, Your mic's not on. Oh, sorry. shoot. Sorry. As far as governance principles go, there were a few I, I felt like I couldn't answer and some I, I'm not sure about, so I don't know how to really go through this. Um, the board's actions occur at the policy level rather than the operational level. And based on our initial discussion, um, my viewpoint <laughs> it doesn't match up with those of the, of the rest of the board, so I kind of hedged on that one. Um, all actions considered by the board were clearly the board's work, and I don't know that that's necessarily true. The board reviews what it, al what it has already said in policy about each specific topic before discussion on that issue, and we, we didn't do that. Um, in writing additional policies, the board starts with, board, with a broad statement and becomes more detailed in a, log in a logical sequence. We didn't, uh, that was not applicable. The board uses less than 15% of board meeting time monitoring past performance, yes. Um, the board routinely spends time monitoring and improving its own process, not applicable today. The board follows an annual calendar based on a plan for accomplishing its job, yes. The board chair helps the board get its job done rather than supervising or becoming involved in staff work, yes. The board spends most of its time debating, defining, and clarifying its vision in linking with its owners and public good as opposed to fixing things. I don't know. Mm. And the board supports the superintendent in any reasonable interpretation of the applicable board policies, yes. Okay, well, thank you doing that work and thank you in advance for writing up a short description of our meeting Take it back to you for the public. All right, um, next we have an executive session, a personnel issue and a superintendent evaluation.